in the name of the Holy and Risen One. Amen. Please be seated. I got a letter in the mail the other day from a woman thanking me for our church sign out on the front lawn. Thanking me for our church sign. She wrote to me, I brought my dog to your pet blessing service last fall and I really enjoyed it. I drive by your church every day on my way to work and I'm always struck by your thought-provoking signs. Thank you for the inspiration. Well, I think a little drive-by inspiration is an okay thing. And of course, I wrote her back immediately, and I invited her to stop and come in any time. But if our sign catches someone's attention as they drive by, that's a good start. We'll take it. Yet I think there are times when there's a bit more to those signs than drive-by inspiration. I'm told that there's a sign outside the Church of All Nations in Jerusalem next to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane, where you will remember that Jesus prayed with his disciples before his arrest and crucifixion. The sign outside this particular church says this, No explanations in church. No explanations in church. I think at a certain level this sign is designed to discourage tour guides from offering noisy lectures amid the prayerfulness of that sacred space. But there's a little bit more to that message. No explanations in church, I think, is really saying to us that there is something unmistakably mysterious about God and God made manifest in Jesus Christ, for which human language mostly falls short. No explanation in church means the Easter story has enough strange twists and turns so as to surpass all human understanding. No explanations in church means there is something incomplete about the resurrection stories that tells us the end of the story is not the end. So if you've come this morning hoping to hear an explanation about what happened at the empty tomb this morning, I'm afraid you'll be disappointed because an explanation, what our rational minds mostly crave when we encounter something that just defies explanation, an explanation of the mystery of God, of Jesus and the empty tomb, would put us in the position of being distant bystanders. An explanation would make us into drive-by witnesses, putting us in a place of watching the story from our rearview mirror of more than 2,000 years. So if we can't satisfy our rational minds this morning, how instead can we feed our hearts, our hearts that break and that love? How instead can we give balm to our souls that long for connection? Something 
Something brought each and every one of us to church this morning. Something brought us all here. It may be different for each one of us. Perhaps it is your tradition to come to church on Easter Sunday. Perhaps you were curious about what this service would be like. Perhaps you come here every Sunday, and if so, thanks be to God. Thank you. Thanks be to God. But I wonder if that's something that brought each and every one of us here this morning is deep down a desire to find ourselves, to find our place in that story of Easter morning. Now the women who followed Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem had watched from a distance as Jesus' body was taken down from the cross. They had watched from a distance as Joseph of Arimathea took the body and wrapped it in linen and placed it in the tomb. Then the women went away to prepare spices that would complete the ritual burial of Jesus' body. But as the women approached the tomb that Sunday morning, the first day of the week, they are focused on bringing the burial of Jesus' body to completion, according to custom. Yes, it was sacred and holy work. These women loved Jesus, yes. And they had done their share of weeping for him. At the same time, this was a task at hand that the women were expected to do. They had work to do, and they were set on completing it. And then, we don't know, but we suspect, they thought they might eventually go on with their lives as usual. But they see the tomb has been opened. They see the body is gone. At first they're perplexed, and then terrified as two men in dazzling white clothes ask them, why do you look for the living among the dead? In this moment, the women are no longer watching from a distance. This is not a drive-by message that they can savor for a few moments and then go on with life as usual. They are instead caught up in a much, much bigger scenario than they ever could have anticipated. There is no looking back. What they have seen cannot be unseen. What they have heard cannot be unheard. Why do you look for him here? He is not in the tomb, but is risen. Go and tell the others. The story defies explanation. And it draws us in. He is no longer dead, but he is risen. And although human language is barely sufficient to describe the movement of God and God made manifest in Christ and the mystery of faith, this message touches the surface. This message I saw this past Holy Week on a church sign not too far from here. It said, we weep, we work, we rise. We weep, we work, we rise. Say it with me. We, we weep, weep, we work, we rise. 
without resorting to explaining the story, without watching the story from a distance. This is the crux, this is the heart of the Easter message. And God's call to us to live every day as disciples of Jesus, as the women who loved him did. We weep, we work, we rise. We weep, we work, we rise. This is where we all, who came here this morning, can find ourselves. This is our place in the story. Like the women that day, who in each of their own lives knew well the whole gamut of human experience, weeping as they had over his death, working to complete their part, and rising to new life with him as they stood as close to the empty tomb as to see the dust on the floor and to breathe in the pungent smells of the garden. We weep, we work, we rise. When we wept on Good Friday at the death of Jesus, we were at the same time called to work, to work on healing and reconciliation. And in doing that, we rise to new life. We weep, we work, we rise. The invitation to the cross of Friday is also an invitation to the empty tomb of this Sunday. When we come to the cross, we find all of the pain and suffering in the world. When we come to the cross, we touch that pain of the stranger, of those we call our enemy, and those we call mothers. <coughs> when we come to the cross, we meet all those who have inspired us, who challenge us, who call forth the best in us, and call us to change and to love one another as he loves us. When we come to the cross, we stand in a sacred moment before and with and in all the pain and all the joy of all the world. This is how we each uniquely live into our own part of the story forever and mysteriously without explanation united with all who have gone before us and all who are to come. We weep, we work, we rise knowing that an invitation to the cross is also an invitation to the empty tomb. He is no longer among the dead, but he is risen. Alleluia. 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 Alleluia.